This is The Saucer Life, a podcast in which we examine concepts, events, or people orbiting the world of flying saucers. Few preconceptions, snark when justified, no belief, no debunking. Today, we're going to be taking a look at the 1965 UFO sightings near Exeter, New Hampshire. The sightings are interesting for a number of reasons, not just because of the very plausible nature of the witness statements, but also because of the way the Air Force and the Department of Defense handled their investigation of the case and their communication with the public. Something else interesting about it is that because of the work of John Fuller, writing in magazines and eventually in a book called Incident at Exeter about the case, this is one of the better known UFO sightings of the area. There's also, as I've learned, an interesting sort of condition where the memory of what was actually sighted in the sky, the illustrations of this doesn't match any of the statements. And this has been sort of investigated by people and documented by people over the years. So there's some interesting assumptions about what people saw that don't match what people actually saw. So there are a few different things going on here, but it's still a fairly compact case, and we should be able to handle it with more uh, with more speed than we were the various shenanigans surrounding Gulf Breeze. And, and honestly, it's nice to have something as straightforward as this, and especially since it's a, a briefer sort of story. Uh, it's good because I've got this awful cold, and I'm not sure how long my voice is going to last. So let's go ahead and get started. <laughs> So one thing that I, I did do or, or sort of didn't do when preparing this episode, I, I pretty much avoided John Fuller's book, Incident at Exeter. One reason for this is that most people who are interested in the topic or the case have read the book. It's a pretty popular one. It sort of shows up in multiple editions printed over and over again. I've never actually read it before I started working on this episode, mostly because it seemed very long for the nature of the case. I was probably shortchanging it at the time, though. But really, the biggest reason that I avoided using it in preparing this episode is that I think it's valuable to work through this story, and all stories, really, but this story in particular, by looking at the unvarnished firsthand accounts and primary sources. I'm an historian. It's, it's an occupational hazard. So let's start on September 3rd, 1965, with what happened to a young man named Norman Muscarello. He was 18 at the time, um, hiking home to Exeter, New Hampshire, along New Hampshire State Highway 150. He had graduated from high school earlier that year and was going to be heading off to the Navy. Soon, he'd been visiting his girlfriend and was on his way home from there. It's about 10 miles, and hitchhiking usually worked out. But uh, tonight, he wasn't having much luck, and he was having to walk a lot of that 10 miles. This is the statement he gave to the Air Force about what he saw. I was hitchhiking on Route 150, three miles southwest of Exeter, New Hampshire, at 0200 hours on the 3rd of September. A group of five bright red lights appeared over a house about 100 feet from where I was standing. The lights were in a line at about a 60-degree angle. They were so bright, they lighted up the area. The lights then moved out over a large field and acted at times like a floating leaf. They would go down behind the trees or behind a house and then reappear. They always moved in the same 60-degree angle. Only one light would be on at a time. They were pulsating 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. They were so bright I could not distinguish any form to the object. I watched these lights for about 15 minutes and they finally disappeared behind some trees and seemed to go into a field. At one time, while I was watching them, they seemed to come so close I jumped into a ditch to keep from being hit. After the lights went into the field, I caught a ride to the Exeter police station and reported what I had seen. Norman wasn't the only person who saw something strange that night. Patrolman Eugene Bertrand also had some interesting encounters. I, Eugene F. Bertrand Jr., was cruising on the morning of the 3rd of September at 0100 on Route 108 Bypass near Exeter, New Hampshire. I noticed an automobile parked on the side of the road and stopped to investigate. I found a woman in the car who stated she was too upset to drive. She stated a light had been following her and had stopped over her car. I stayed with her about 15 minutes but was unable to see anything. I departed and reported back to the Exeter police station where I found Norman Muscatello. He related his story of seeing some bright red lights in a field. 
After talking to him a while, I decided to take him back to where he said he had seen the lights. When we arrived, I parked the patrol cruiser and turned off the lights. There was nothing unusual in the area. Mr. Muscatello and I got out of the cruiser and started walking into the field with a flashlight. When we had gone about 50 feet, a group of five bright red lights came from behind a group of trees near us. They were extremely bright and flashed on one at a time. The lights started to move around over the field. At one time, they came so close, I fell to the ground and started to draw my gun. The lights were so bright, I was unable to make out any form. There was no sound or vibration, but the farm animals were upset in the area and making a lot of noise. When the lights started coming near us again, Mr. Muscatello and I ran for the car. I radioed patrolman David Hunt, who arrived in a few minutes. He also observed the lights, which were still over the field, but not as close as before. The lights moved out across the field at an estimated altitude of 100 feet and finally disappeared in the distance at the same altitude. The lights were always in line at about a 60 degree angle. When the object moved, the lower lights were always forward of the others. So we've got a witness. The witness goes to the authorities. The authorities say, this sounds interesting. Let's go back and take a look. They go back out there and you've got a very similar subsequent sighting and they call in someone else, patrolman David R. Hunt. I, David R. Hunt, at about 0255 on the morning of the 3rd of September, received a call from patrolman Bertrand to report to an area about three miles southwest of Exeter, New Hampshire. Upon arriving at the scene, I observed a group of bright red lights flashing in sequence. They appeared to be about one half mile over a field to the southeast. After observing the lights for a short period of time, they moved off in a southeasterly direction and disappeared in the distance. The lights appeared to remain at the same altitude, which I estimate to be about 100 feet. Three different witnesses, three different statements. Uh, four witnesses, if you count hearsay, the, the woman who uh, patrolman Bertrand talked about or talked to previously. And the three statements we have, 60 degree angle comes up, um, red lights come up, 100 feet altitude comes up. Uh, those are things are all consistent. So this is clearly something that these people are seeing. We also have a recording of Patrolman Bertrand talking about his perspective of the sighting after Hunt arrived. There was a bright red object come up over the trees and uh, actually uh, started towards us. I got a hold of him and dragged him back into the cruiser. At this point, uh, Officer Hunt showed up. He, I called in saying that I was going to be out of the cruiser, so he had started out and he showed up. And I turned to look back at it, and it turned and gone down towards the end of the field about 100 yards away and we all three of us stood and watched it. it had no wings on it it had uh, bright lights around it red lights that did not give off a beam like many lights give off it was a glow like a neon sign and there was no plane in the area that night we just watched it head towards the coast and uh, it disappeared uh, over the horizon it made no noise now the horses and the animals around there apparently could hear some kind of a noise because they were really, the horses were kicking the sides of the barn. Some people were seeing it before them, but they didn't say nothing about it. They're afraid people would laugh at them. There really is some nice consistency to these reports and to these, to these witness sightings. So the two police officers, Hunt and uh, Bertrand, talk to their superiors, and the police chief goes to Peace Air Force Base in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, which... It isn't that far away. It's it's New Hampshire. Nothing is, is that far away. It's, it's a small place. The investigation at Peace Air Force Base was led by Major David Griffin and Lieutenant Alan Brandt. And there was a lot of, a lot of interest in this story. As we're going to see, these were not the only UFO sightings that had taken place in this area during, uh, during this period of time. And the Air Force men in New Hampshire seem like they might have been a little overwhelmed. On October 15th, Lieutenant Brandt contacts Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, the home of Project Blue Book, and explains that they need some help explaining to the public what might be going on. There have been an unusually high number of reported sightings of unidentified flying objects in the Peace Air Force Base, New Hampshire area, which have been the subject of much discussion and numerous newspaper, radio, and television reports. Many of these sightings have been reported to this base, and your records will show that we have performed thorough investigations of them. Other reports, which we have learned of secondhand, have been made to local police departments and, in a few cases, to newspapers. Several members of this command have actually been called to view UFOs by sincere and sober citizens, but as yet, we have always been too late or unlucky. 
The most interesting sighting in the nearby town of Exeter aroused special interest as two policemen saw the object at very close range. It is the subject of an article in the current issue of the Saturday Review of Literature. Do you operate a speaker's bureau, or would you be able to suggest where I might obtain a knowledgeable Air Force spokesman who could explain the Air Force UFO program and what happens to reports sent to your organization? The response from the Air Force back to Lieutenant Brandt was kind of telling. The Air Force does not, as a rule, provide speakers to private groups on the subject of UFOs. Past experience has indicated that talks on this subject only serve to generate additional requests for speakers and creates additional interest in the subject. So we don't like to explain to people what we're doing to investigate UFOs because they might want us to talk more about what we're doing to investigate UFOs, and it will just remind people that UFOs are a thing and create additional stories, additional claims. The Air Force, you can just tell, it's just dripping with this sense of why do we need to keep talking about UFOs? This is so frustrating. We hate it. And I don't know, I kind of wonder to what degree people in the Air Force were sent to work on Blue Book when they had screwed up somewhere else. And so they're given this very frustrating public-facing job just, I don't know, as a punishment. I have nothing to base that on. I'm just imagining at least some of the people who worked for Blue Book at some point were there not of their own free will or interest. So Brandt did say that the newspapers had gotten involved, the the Saturday Review of Literature was involved, and other stories, despite the fact that the Air Force men had told the witnesses not to talk to the press, the story got out anyway, into local papers, newswires, Saturday Review of Literature, etc. With a few days of the original sighting, it was all over the United States. And one example is a story from the uh, – it's from the Associated Press, but the version I got it from – The version I got was from the September 8th, 1965 edition of the San Francisco Examiner. What's interesting about the story is that it talks about the the Exeter case that we've been discussing, but it says there were numerous reports of UFO sightings in southeastern New Hampshire over a period of six weeks. Um, All of them, they said, have five red lights blinking in sequence, and these have been seen since July 29th. and It's September when um when when our sighting occurs they recap the muscarello sighting and say that quote at least one similar sighting was reported almost every night last week according to sources at the air base so this is not just this one evening when norman was hitchhiking this is a much longer thing now in october griffin would pass along his report of his investigation to Project Blue Book for further inquiry. And in his report to Blue Book, he includes this. At this time, have been unable to arrive at a probable cause of this sighting. Three observers seem to be stable, reliable persons, especially the two patrolmen. I viewed the area of the sighting and found nothing in that area that could be the probable cause. Peace Air Force Base had five B-47 aircraft flying in the area during this period, but do not believe they had any connection with the sighting. So Griffin is not afraid to admit to the people at Blue Book that he does not know what people might have seen, that nothing that he's looked into makes sense as a cause. And there seems to be, at least at this point in the story, a refreshing amount of honesty from these uh, these these people at Peace Air Force Base who are looking into this issue. There's no minimization of the case. There's no dismissal of these witnesses. Uh, there's no sort of mockery of these witnesses. What we do have is a case where I think that because – two of the witnesses were members of law enforcement, that there might have been a little more attention paid to this case or a little more credibility given to it. Now, that would not be the case forever. So Griffin sends this case to Blue Book at Wright-Patterson for them to look into after he had already investigated it there in New Hampshire. Before Blue Book could issue a report or finish their investigation, the Pentagon, not Blue Book, just the Pentagon, the Defense Department, issued a statement to the local press. 
This occurred on October 27th, 1965, and John Fuller wrote about this in an article in August of 1966 for True Magazine. The Pentagon believes that after intensive investigation, it has come up with a natural explanation of the UFO sightings in Exeter, New Hampshire on September 3rd. A spokesman said the several reports stemmed from multiple objects in the area, by which they mean a high-altitude strategic air command exercise out of Westover, Massachusetts, was going on at the time in the area. A second important factor was what it called a weather inversion, wherein a layer of cold air is trapped between warm layers. The Pentagon spokesman said this natural phenomenon causes stars and planets to dance and twinkle. The spokesman said, We believe what the people saw that night was stars and planets in unusual formations. This is almost a little bit of an Air Force or military greatest hits explanation for things. Weather inversions. You just saw the stars. There might have been aircraft in the area without really addressing the actual things that people saw. It's kind of disappointing, but not really surprising. Well, maybe a little surprising after sort of Major Griffin's sort of admission, we don't know what this could be. And then the Pentagon saying, after intensive investigation, when? By whom? Uh, Because Blue Book still hasn't issued its own explanation for this. Patrolman Bertrand, talking to John Fuller for that August 1966 article in True Magazine had his own take on what the Pentagon was saying. If they want to turn out ridiculous statements like that, that's their business. I know what I saw, they don't. And of course, I can't accept what they say there. I know for sure it had nothing to do with the weather. I know for sure this was a craft, and it was not any plane in existence. I know for sure it was not more than 100 feet off the ground. I'm not saying it's something from outer space. I'm saying I don't know what it was. And from this newspaper story they've released, I know damn well they don't either. I know it didn't have any wings, and I know it wasn't a helicopter or no balloon or anything of that sort. It's absolutely stupid of them to release something like that. So Patrolman Bertrand is not convinced. And I think it's important to note here that he is not saying this is this is a spaceship. He's not saying these are aliens. He's saying he doesn't know, which is, as you know, here in the Saucer Life, an attitude we very much enjoy. When we come back from a brief break, we are going to see what Blue Book did have to say about this case and what the witnesses had to say back to Blue Book and what Blue Book might have said back to the witnesses, if they had chosen to. It gets a little interesting, folks, and we'll be right back. If you like The Saucer Life and want more, you can support us in exchange for bonus content. Recently, we did a watch-along of the first episode of Project UFO, which was a lot of fun. And guess what the Air Force's explanation for the sighting was? It was a temperature inversion. So yes, neat little uh, coincidence there. Uh, There's also appearances from The Saucer Wife on some of the bonus episodes and all sorts of other things. And over the last 10 months since we've started it up, we've built a nice library of materials, not just from The Saucer Life, but also from our show Great Lakes Lore. So there's a lot there for you to dive into. You can check it out at patreon.com slash chizomedia or uh, via the link in the show notes. You can also check out past episodes of the show at Saucer Life or in your favorite podcast app, five years worth at this point. And as always, we're on Twitter and Instagram at Saucer Life, and you can email us at thesaucerlife at gmail.com. You can contact us by post at Chizo Media, P.O. Box 68, Grand Blank, Michigan, 48480. Now, some responses to our last episode, uh, which was the second part of things about the Gulf Breeze 6. Matthew says, as I listened to this series, I could not help but imagine a scenario in which the U.S. Army decides that these folks are not only untrustworthy, to put it mildly, but also suffering from some sort of mental illness or delusions. The military may have quietly referred them to mental health professionals and shown them the door under a general discharge. A charitable viewpoint that would have Kehoe frothing, to be sure, but more plausible to me than Hoagland's science. Well, Almost anything is more plausible than Hoagland's science, Matthew. And yes, it would not be um, it would not be unthinkable that the army did use the general discharge process to um, try to get these people some help if they thought they needed it uh, through the um, 
through the the Veterans Affairs system or something like that. Uh, also, listener Red Pill Junkie thought I was snarkier than usual, but not snarkier than warranted. Well, the presence of both Sean David Morton and Richard Hoagland tends to have that kind of uh, that kind of effect on me. As for right now, let's get back to the very unsnarky accounts of what happened in Exeter, New Hampshire, and what Project Blue Book had to say about it. In an undated letter sometime in November of 1965, the head of Project Blue Book, Major Hector Quintanilla Jr., wrote to Bertrand and Hunt at the Exeter Police Department in Exeter, New Hampshire. Now, in what you're going to hear from this letter, originally the name of Norman Muscarello was redacted, but we know who it is. So this is what Hector Quintanilla had to say to our two patrolmen. Gentlemen, the sighting of various unidentified objects by you and Mr. Muscarello was investigated by officials from Peace Air Force Base, New Hampshire, and the report has been forwarded to our office at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This sighting at Exeter, New Hampshire on the night of 2nd September has been given considerable publicity through various news releases and in magazine articles similar to that from the Saturday Review of 2nd October 1965. A portion of this article is attached for your information. This information was released by the National Investigations Committee on Aerial Phenomenon, a private organization which has no connection with the government. As a result of these articles, the Air Force has received inquiry as to the cause of this report. Our investigation and evaluation of this sighting indicates a possible association with an 8th Air Force operation, Big Blast. In addition to aircraft from this operation, there were five B-47 type aircraft flying in the area during this period. Before a final evaluation of your sighting can be made, it is essential for us to know if either of you witnessed any aircraft in the area during this time period, either independently or in connection with the objects observed. Since there were many aircraft in the area at that time, and there were no reports of unidentified objects from personnel engaged in this air operation, we might then assume that the objects observed between midnight and 2 a.m. might be associated with this military air operation. If, however, these aircraft were noted by either of you, then this would tend to eliminate the air operation as a plausible explanation for the objects observed. So, basically, something else might have been going on. But we don't know if that's the thing you were seeing until you tell us if there were other airplanes going on at the same time as what you saw with the red lights, etc. So this is a little different. Actually, it's a lot different from the earlier Pentagon explanation that it was stars, planets, temperature inversion, things like that. But it still moves things out of the realm of strange sightings and into you mistook conventional aircraft for something else. On December 2nd, 1965, Hunt and Bertrand responded. Dear sir, we were very glad to get your letter during the third week in November because as you might imagine, we have been the subject of considerable ridicule since the Pentagon released its final evaluation of our sighting. In other words, both Patrolman Hunt and myself saw this object at close range, checked it out with each other, confirmed and reconfirmed the fact that this was not any kind of conventional aircraft, that it was at an altitude of not more than a couple hundred feet, and went to considerable trouble to confirm that the weather was clear, there was no wind, no chance of weather inversion, and that what we were seeing was no illusion or military or civilian craft. We entered this in a complete official police report as a supplement to the blotter of the morning of September 3rd, since our job depends on accuracy and an ability to tell the difference between fact and fiction, we were naturally disturbed by the Pentagon report which attributed the sighting to multiple high-altitude objects in the area and weather inversion. What is a little difficult to understand is the fact that your letter arrived considerably after the Pentagon release. Since your letter says you are still in the process of making a final evaluation, it seems that there is an inconsistency here. Ordinarily, this wouldn't be too important, except for the fact that in a situation like this, we are naturally very reluctant to be considered irresponsible in our official report to the police station. This is a really good point. Why is Blue Book asking these questions when the Pentagon has already issued a different explanation and says that intensive investigation 
has taken place. Does the right hand not know what the left hand is doing, or are they talking to each other and trying to muddy the waters? The letter continues. Since one of us, Patrolman Bertrand, was in the Air Force for four years engaged in refueling operations with all kinds of military aircraft, it was impossible to mistake what we saw for any type of military operation, regardless of altitude. It was also definitely not a helicopter or balloon. Immediately after the object disappeared, we did see what probably was a B-47 at high altitude, but it bore no relation at all to the object we saw. Another fact is that the time of our observation was nearly an hour after 2 a.m., which would eliminate the 8th Air Force Operation Big Blast, since, as you say, this took place between midnight and 2 a.m. Mr. Muscatello, who first reported this object before we went to the site, saw it somewhere in the vicinity of 2 a.m., but nearly an hour had passed before he got to the police station, and we went out to the location with him. We would both appreciate it very much if you would help us eliminate the possible conclusion that some people have made in that we might have A, made up the story, or B, were incompetent observers. Anything you could do along this line would be very much appreciated, and I'm sure you understand the position we're in. We appreciate the problems the Air Force must have with a lot of irresponsible reports on this subject, and don't want to cause you any unnecessary trouble. On the other hand, we think you probably understand our position. Major, we didn't see anything remotely like your Operation Big Blast, and even if we had, it was at the wrong time, unless you're wrong about the time. We would really appreciate it if you would issue something that stops making us look stupid in front of the community members we have sworn to serve and protect. That's a little more blunt than what they actually wrote, but the meaning is there. It's it's an awkward letter. They're, they're being forceful, but polite at the same time. So how does Quintanilla and Project Blue Book respond? Well, they don't. On December 23rd, the two patrolmen write a second letter to Major Quintanilla, reiterating why Operation Big Blast, as described by Quintanilla, doesn't fit with what they actually saw, and reiterating also their concerns about their reputation in light of the Air Force's explanations and or refusal to issue a further explanation to counter the supposedly, apparently, premature Pentagon explanation. What bothers us most is that many people are thinking that we were either lying or not intelligent enough to tell the difference between what we saw and something ordinary. Three other people saw the same thing on September 3rd, and two of them appeared to be in shock from it. This was absolutely not a case of mistaken identity. We both feel it's very important for our jobs and our reputations to get some kind of letter from you to say that the story which the Pentagon put out was not true. It could not possibly be, because we were the people who saw this, not the Pentagon. Can you please let us hear from you as soon as possible? So the patrolmen are getting a little concerned, maybe a little desperate to have their reputations cleared up. One possible reason for the delay in getting a response is that the Air Force simply hadn't finished their investigation based on the new information or the re-explained information from Bertrand and Hunt. A letter from Blue Book officials to um, to to the the sort of higher ups in the Air Force in January of 1966 said that they were delaying their reply about the Exeter sighting because of the information about when. The patrolmen saw what they saw, that it was after the big blast um, exercises. And so that couldn't be the explanation. The wheels continue turning. And finally, in November of 1966, November 9th, 1966, Lieutenant Colonel John Spaulding writes to Hunt and Bertrand. Gentlemen. Based on the additional information you submitted to our UFO investigation office at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio, we have been unable to identify the object you observed on September 3, 1965. In 19 years of investigating over 10,000 reports of unidentified flying objects, the evidence has proved almost conclusively that reported aerial phenomenon have been objects either created and sent aloft by man, generated by atmospheric conditions, or caused by celestial bodies or the residue of meteoric activity. Thank you for reporting your observation to the Air Force and for your subsequent cooperation regarding the report. I regret any inconvenience you may have suffered as a result. 
so the Air Force admits that it doesn't know what these men saw and the other witnesses saw. They don't know. Their initial supposition that it was Operation Big Blast doesn't work out based on the timeline, and they just can't identify it. It is literally an unidentified flying object. However, they are pretty quick to couch that in some sort of weaselly terms, aren't they? It's like in, in you know 10,000 cases, vast majority are natural phenomenon or something man-made. Yeah, that's that's great, and that's absolutely true. But this isn't that, or at least you can't find any evidence that it's that. Now, I don't expect the Air Force to say, well, clearly this is a alien spacecraft or something like that, but it's still nice to get that kind of, yeah, we don't know what it is either. John Fuller's conclusions to all this in his 1966 article in True Magazine sums up some of the pertinent issues with this case. The most logical but still unprovable explanation is that the unidentified flying objects are interplanetary spaceships under intelligent control. NICAP and others have been supporting this hypothesis for years. Its credibility, however, has suffered by the support of the crackpot fringe. In spite of this, the hypothesis remains stronger than any other theory advanced. The biggest remaining question is the apparent attitude of government and scientific authorities who have shown no indication of setting up a full-scale project either to prove or disprove the existence of UFOs. Or if they have, the ostensible paternalistic protection of the public is not consistent with democratic principles. The reaction of those who have experienced close encounters with UFOs in the extra area has been one of shock, followed by intense curiosity rather than sustained panic. An unprepared public is far more likely to panic than an informed one, truth isn't likely to remain hidden forever. In the light of recent developments, the situation has reached a point where it appears to be the duty and responsibility of the government either to reveal what it knows or to order a scientific investigation on a major scale and report the findings immediately to the public at large. So some wider context. This article, this, this conclusion from Fuller, this comes out in the August 1966 issue of uh, True Magazine. By that time, we not only have had the Air Force admit it doesn't know what happened in Exeter. They don't know what people th saw. This is also after the March 1966 swamp gas sightings in Michigan, so-called swamp gas sightings. So the pressure is building, as you can see from, from Fuller's response to this. Pressure is building for investigations, public investigations, not Air Force investigations, into – what the UFO subject is. When Congress begins looking at the UFO question in the 1960s, investigator Ray Fowler, Raymond Fowler, is going to enter this case, this Exeter case, into the congressional record. He's going to get that in there. And in the testimony, um, when they're questioning in Congress, questioning Dr. J. Allen Hynek of Project Blue Book, they bring up the Exeter case as an example of one of that 5% of Blue Book cases that is unexplained. Hynek says he did not uh, investigate it personally. He did not go there to work on that case. His knowledge comes from where? It comes from John Fuller's article in True Magazine and, and Fuller's other writings on the subject. Hynek, the Blue Book advisor, is relying on what journalists are saying about the UFOs in addition to his own investigations. We're getting to the point where things might start breaking open a little bit. What happens with these investigations? Well, at some point in the future, we're probably going to have an episode about those investigations, about the Condon Committee, and we'll see what happens then. So one last thing. I mentioned that there's some interesting things that happen in the future from this case about depictions of what was seen in Exeter, New Hampshire. This came to my attention from um, Martin Kottmeyer, who uh, responded to a social media post that we were doing this episode with, you know, it's the case nobody gets right. The illustrations are, are never right. And he sent me, uh, he sent me an article with some information about this. And it's fascinating because you remember the description of the craft from the eyewitness reports, five lights blinking on and off sequentially too dark or I mean, not too dark, too bright. The lights are too bright to see any distinct shape. 60 degree angles, the way it's moving, all of that. So here's some examples of different ways the 
craft has been depicted over time. Um, UFOs, The Greatest Mystery by Hillary Evans that came out in 1979, um, apparently had an illustration of this craft that uh, said it was bowl-shaped. Um, it was had one red light on top, five windows, a red circle along the rim, um, and a triangular fin, which is nothing like was illustrated by the words of the eyewitnesses. In other cases, descriptions of the craft cited by Norman Muscarello and the others are illustrated as matching the description that Fuller gives of the craft in his book, Interrupted Journey, about the Betty and Barney Hill incident. Um, I guess because they were both in New Hampshire or something. So that is, uh, that is also very, very interesting. Um, in general, what we seem to have is the imposition of popular flying saucer imagery onto the, the story of what actually happened in September of 1965, almost as if sequentially blinking red lights that the Air Force couldn't identify aren't interesting enough. So we have to illustrate this as a flying saucer, or maybe it's just a more eye-catching, uh, eye-catching imagery. But it's interesting to note that you know, the, the actual thing that people saw isn't usually the thing that's depicted in illustrations accompanying the story. Finally, I must mention that in 2011, Joe Nickel and James McGaha, a retired Air Force major, wrote an article in Skeptical Inquirer magazine explaining what might have been seen in Exeter. Uh, McGaha, a retired Air Force major, um, had been a pilot and he had been refueled by KC-97 tanker aircraft, which were stationed at Peace Air Force Base in 1965. He says that the flashing red light pattern reported by witnesses um, was similar to the pattern that is on those tankers. The refueling boom hung down at a 60-degree angle and would flutter when not being controlled by the boom operator. So the object floating like a leaf, it could be that. On the other hand, I don't know. Bertrand said he was familiar with refueling operations from his time in the Air Force. So I don't know if that is a reasonable explanation. And if it was a reasonable explanation, why didn't the Air Force put forward that explanation in 1965? Because this was an Air Force thing and it was right at that air base. Maybe – there weren't any of those operations going on at the time that would have matched. I don't know. Just seems like maybe kind of a uh, kind of a, a weak explanation. And maybe that's because I think this is a fascinating example of one of that percentage of blue book cases that is unexplained, that resists easy categorization, that had strong witnesses who told consistent stories. Maybe that is why I'm resistant to easy explanations like, oh, it's the very planes at the Air Force base that investigated the sightings initially, and they just, what, didn't notice? In any case, a fun little case that uh, got an enormous amount of press. It was part of that massive wave of sightings in the mid-1960s that stretched across the country, and perhaps most significant for, along with the swamp gas cases in Michigan in March of 66, in bringing public demand for better answers to the fore and in a way forcing the government's hand to launch those investigations which as we'll see in the future have a lasting effect on ufo culture in the united states <laughs> Thank you for listening. Remember to send in your questions and comments via the usual social media or email channels, and we'll be addressing those next time. Our associate producer is Simpson J. Hanover III, and The Saucer Life is a production of Chizo Media, LLC. Chizo Media, our heart is with the people. Till next time, keep watching the skies because the skies are watching you. <laughs>